Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Glad Sapursky. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Roman Peskin, the CEO and founder of EVLTR. I believe that's how it's pronounced, but you can correct me. And we'll talk about his company. But first, we'll focus on his experience with remote work. So I know that you have substantial experience with remote work. And before the show, we we're chatting about what kind of things are best done remotely and what kind of things are best done in the office. So can you please share your perspective on that? I think, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, almost anything can be done remotely well. Uh, maybe in our case, with an exception of sales. Mm. Uh, salespeople function better when you when you put them in the box in, a, in one room and they sort of stew and brew there in their uh, in their own environment. They need this uh, high energy uh, environment. They need that mm. little noise going on. They need to hear others, uh, you know, other reps on the, on the phone. There's a lot of exchange of uh, uh, ideas happening and they can hear others speaking. Oh, that's a nice phrase that you use mm -hmm. in the push. And um, it doesn't really happen very well in uh, rem a remote environment. Mm -hmm. um, our policy is that we do allow sales folks to work uh, remotely um, after they have worked for a number of months from the office and mm -hmm. after they've learned everything and showed good numbers and they went on a provisional uh, work from home uh, month. And if mm -hmm. the numbers didn't dip, then they can continue. Mm -hmm. uh, but more like more generally speaking, uh, remote for sales uh, always has shown lower numbers than mm -hmm. uh, um, sales from the office. That makes sense. Now, how do you manage the other aspects of remote work? So how do you make sure that all the other challenges of remote work, collaboration, innovation, other team members, that they function effectively in a remote setting? First of all, it's like, I like cooking. I like cooking, I like eating, I like food. And people often ask like, how do you cook decent XXX? And then, hmm. you know, put your favorite dish in there. And it always starts with picking right ingredients and then just not screwing up. <laughs> uh, that's the that's pretty much their, their their approach to good to good dishes. So you 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 pick good people and mm -hmm. then just let them do their work. Mm. Um, not in the micromanaging sense at all. Mm -hmm. um, you make sure they have all the resources they need. Mm -hmm. They make sure that they have you know the onboarding and the training uh, that they need to do the job, and you just let them do the job. Um, I'm, it comes down to how people understand what's a life and work balance. Um, when, when, when I'm asked, what's your approach to work life balance? I was like, listen, guys, if we think that a traditional approach to work life balance is working from say, it doesn't matter what the number is, but say from nine to five. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so before five it's work and after five. I'm done with work and getting my balance and it's going to be life now. But if you say that your life starts after five, it, it, you logically must afford the, the idea that before five, you didn't have a life <laughs> that work, that work is not life and it's not compatible with life. And I strongly oppose such sentiment. Mm. I think I think we live 24 seven. And uh, sometimes mm -hmm. we work in, in odd hours, just because I feel like it. It's not because mm -hmm. I'm being ex exploited by someone. But if I feel like, you know, uh, at 11 p.m., I, I have energy and I have an inspiration to go and do mm -hmm. something, I'm going to go and do something. And um, for example, me personally, I'm probably getting old and I'm getting more productive in the early mornings now. I used mm. to be uh, sort of a night owl and now I'm actually more of an uh, early bird. And uh, in, when, I'm, when I'm in Kiev, we traditionally start working um, 
the team starts working at noon so that we're a little more aligned with the US part of the team. Okay. Yeah, the, our official hour is um, in Kiev are at noon to uh, 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. But I get up at 7 and I start working at 7 just because I'm productive at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, by, by the time uh, teams come up online, I've, I've done, uh, I've, been, I've been very, very productive. I've done a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but I leave a little early because I'm, I'm pretty much useless at 8 p.m. <laughs> um, and and uh, and that's how we uh, treat the team. We have certain hours when we expect and sort of demand people to overlap their work schedule mm -hmm. so that they can be found online and have you know the Zoom meetings and so yeah. on. But uh, other than that, we're very flexible with the time with schedule. We mm -hmm. have people in various time zones, and some of the time zones are you know 11, 12 hours away. Um, as long as you do the job, as long as mm -hmm. you know how to do the job, it doesn't matter where you are. That's interesting. So kind of being productive outside of the quote unquote typical hours. So I helped 21 companies transition to hybrid remote work. And one of the issues that is a challenge is this idea of burnout expectations. So what we did is we established clear expectations that you can send emails outside of work hours, but you should, are not expected to respond to emails or Slack messages outside of work hours. Inside work hours, you're expected to respond, I mean, it depends on the company, but let's say you're expected to respond to a Slack message within two hours, within a certain shared period of time, you're expected to respond to an email message by the next day. So those sorts of expectations we found have helped reduce burnout and help people have clear expectations and norms about who is there, who is engaged, who is not and how they actually communicate with each other effectively. So I'm curious if you found some of that in your own work. That's very true. And that's exactly how we do that. Because when mm -hmm. I'm in, uh, when I'm in California, and I, I'm used to living in two different time zones before the, um, the Russian war in Ukraine, I used to spend 50-50 mm -hmm. uh, about a month of my time in Kiev, Ukraine and a month of my time in, in uh, California. So um, naturally, there will always be time when I'm out of sync time wise with someone sure. in my team. And uh, th then uh, we ask people to treat messages that come during the offline hours to treat them as an, an inbox. You don't have to respond to them. You don't have mm -hmm. to read them. You don't have to act upon them. Um, and that's how I do that. I'm, I'm, I'm trained myself to look at, oh, I have 25 unread messages in Slack. Like, okay, well, I'm going to read them when I feel like it. Mm -hmm. um, um, and by the way, we have eliminated email uh, completely. Like we okay. don't use email. Uh, we only use email to communicate with the outside world, but mm -hmm. uh, in, internally it's it's uh, it's Slack only. Mm -hmm. But then there's also an escalation mechanism. If someone is needed now, mm -hmm. then uh, it's a telegram uh, or that's our favorite messenger. But I understand that some teams might have, you know, WhatsApp or something. Sure. Um, for example, I have uh, Slack notifications uh, turned off on my phone. I don't mm -hmm. want it to ding every time. Makes you know, sense. the team sends me a message, but I do have a habit of checking them every half an hour or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they need me urgently, then they can, you know, ping me in Telegram and that pretty much ensures almost immediate response. Um, yeah, the ability of a team to organize its, uh, its work processes um, around different time zones uh, is very important in the remote work settings mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Now, we we're chatting before the start of the show that I have family in Kiev, and obviously you live you know, in Kiev and you still somewhat live in Kiev. How did the approach to remote work change for your Kiev team, given the war? I know you said you have an office in Kiev, and but now most people work remotely. So tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, we did have an, when we do have an office um, for anyone but sales team, it was sort of an optional place to go to, but it mm -hmm. was never enforced. Uh, it was more like, hey guys, if you need a place to work and you don't feel comfortable at home uh, for various reasons, some people just want to get away from home, uh, from, you know, because uh, at home there was a fridge, there's a TV, there's a coach, sure. uh, you know, the, all these things that get, it, get in between you and work. 
And uh, a lot of people used to like uh, coming to the office because, you know, they, they meet their colleagues, coworkers, mm -hmm. they hang out, uh, some social activity. Um, but sales, like I said before, they, you know, they would just go there uh, mandatory. Mm -hmm. Then the war happened and uh, the remote work was like taking Zoom calls from bomb shelters. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not kidding, I have... Yeah a lot of recordings of uh, people taking Zoom calls from literally bomb shelters. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I have recordings with the air raid sirens going on the background. Wow. And, uh, and well, they go off in Kiev today, two or three times during the day. Mm -hmm. I just came from there two days ago. So um, that's pretty much a new norm now. Yeah. And uh, um, Unfortunately, a lot of people learn to ignore them, and uh, uh, well, some sometimes those are the things that shouldn't be ignored. But anyways, and then the team has spread out across um, mostly Western Ukraine because Kiev wasn't a very safe place in the yeah. beginning of the war, sure. and uh, you know a lot of people left Kiev, and uh, we tried, you know, to help sometimes when we could uh to find to find a place where to go some people came to europe uh mm -hmm. we have offices in uh in hungary in poland in romania and um in prague and so our sort of main european office is in hungary in budapest uh, so a lot of people came to budapest um uh, because there was like an established base there where mm. they, they could come and uh, we uh, we rented a, a motel on the outskirts of the city, mm -hmm. uh, the ho the whole motel, the entire. But that was our oh. base for our operations for I think good half a year. Um, at some point, there were like about 30, 40 people uh, from Ukraine living there temporarily before they find something else, uh, like a permanent uh, apartment in the city or. They moved on they went to other countries or they went back so those are whole sort of uh, uh temporary facility going on mm -hmm. there um now it's sort of more settled um those people who wanted to be in kiev really really bad then they went back to kiev uh some remained in europe some are still in the in the west of ukraine which I expect is going to be more and more difficult because of the, you know, energy situation in yeah. Ukraine. Um, um, myself included, some people are, were less terrified by the bombs, uh, just simply given the statistical chance of, you know, a bomb hitting your building wasn't very, very high. <laughs> but um, now when, when, you know, the blackouts, when uh, half of the city sits without the energy, uh, without power for uh, half a day, then that pretty much destroys the lifestyle as it is. Uh, you can't yeah. work, you can't do anything, you don't have water. So I would probably expect a new wave of people living in Ukraine mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That makes sense. And then you will be, your company will be sponsoring them, sheltering them, helping them figure out what to do in Europe. Somewhere. If you folks came over to the US um, and um, we actually finally opened an office in the US hmm. um, a few months ago for the salespeople, like I said, only. Oh. Um, although, you know, we have uh, some production people in the US that are welcome to come to the office if they want mm -hmm. to. Uh, but the the main reason for uh, opening the office was uh, to create a, a U.S. Uh, located uh, sales team. We have had sales teams in uh, Ukraine. That's how we started. Then we had one in, and we still have one in Mexico, in Mexico City, and now we have one in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's turn back. We've been talking a little bit about your company. Let's turn back and uh, have you share about your entrepreneurial journey. How did you come to? start ELTVR and we'll share a little bit more about the company, of course. We call it elevator. It's just like elevator without the elevator. Balance. Okay. Elevator. Um, Fair enough. Good. No. Well, uh, elevator goes um, back in its roots to a Ukrainian company called Laba, L-A-B-A. -A. And um, Laba has started um, 
doing online education courses about seven years ago in Ukraine and over time it quickly grew in a household name in Ukraine mm -hmm. pretty much um, uh, you know amongst the younger young professional uh, community uh, pretty much everyone knows it and a lot of people have taken a course or two or three or mm -hmm. five from uh, from LABA and uh, when I met the founder of LABA a couple of years ago, I was like, oh, well, maybe not a, such a bad idea to um, export this into other countries. And mm -hmm. um, we decided that we're going to create a separate brand for uh, for the U.S. market. Um, I joined the company as a co-founder, although initially I was not the one who created the, the very initial uh, mm -hmm. uh, company. But I'm the one who runs the U.S. business and um, overall English speaking countries business. And um, now, uh, LABA as a global company, we operate Elevator brand in the US, uh, mm -hmm. LABA brand in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. Uh, we also have a Squot brand in uh, Europe for uh, creative uh, classes. And um, I believe we're soon going to be in a few other large East, um, West European markets. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we're looking at a few others worldwide. And so tell us a little bit more about what Elevator does. We do online courses, uh, mm -hmm. but they're quite different from uh, almost any others. It's a cohort based education, so it's not mm. um, it's not an asynchronous uh, course. We believe that uh, proper education should be happening through an interaction with your instructor mm -hmm. between instructors and students. They've got to be uh, a certain degree of interaction. So our courses are live online in Zoom um, and um, it increases the participation, it increases the completion rate because I'll tell you uh, honestly that the main, the, one of the two main problems with online education is that the completion rate is terribly low. Yeah. Um, people who buy courses online, they tend not to go through it and yep. finish them. It's the same as you go into uh, Barnes and Noble's uh, bookstore and you buy a book, uh, make an impulse purchase, spend twenty dollars, thinking, "Oh, I'm buying this book, you know, and about marketing, and I'm investing in myself, and I'm going to be uh, smarter about marketing when I buy this book." Well, the the big surprise is that you're going to become smarter about marketing when you read this book, not when <laughs> you buy it. Um, and I'm guilty as charged as well. I have a bookshelf full of books that I haven't read and I maybe have skimmed through them and, you know, just scan them, but not read them. And I bought them for some reason. <laughs> and uh, I, I brought them home, put them on the bookshelf and never opened them again. That happened to me. And the same happens with online courses. But when the course is in taught in real life, in real time, not in real life, uh, but uh, uh, then people tend to show up because it's, you know, Wednesdays and Fridays at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. And um, you have also a possibility to talk to your instructor. And then the other important differentiator is that as opposed to most uh, online course platforms where they're platforms in the sense that you can build your own course about anything and you can put it on this platform and start selling it. And if it sells well, great. The problem is that nobody curates these people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to understand whether or not they have credentials to teach sure. about anything. And um, I'm a big fan of credentials. Um, uh, I think you know before you teach anything, you you know should really know how to do this yes. uh, first. And um, unfortunately, with online education in this uh, in this area, when you know, from Instagram, every other ad is, is screaming at you about, you know, I'm going to teach you how to make a million dollars in five <laughs> days. Yeah. Um, um, or I'm going to teach you this, I'm going to teach you that. I, you, uh, just give me a little bit of money and I'm going to teach you something tremendous. Um, I don't think if these people have ever done this. Um, and like, who said they're qualified to teach? So we do this differently. We 
basically headhunt our uh, our instructors ourselves. Uh, uh, we build our courses. Uh, the very curated. All our instructors come from uh, very famous blue chip companies mm-hmm. uh, with high level positions within these companies, and no one ever. Uh, will question their uh, credibility and their credentials for teaching a particular subject. They've done it many years. They've done it at uh, multiple um, famous companies. So that's mm-hmm. that's our approach. In um, uh, online life courses taught mm-hmm. by uh, unquestionable experts. Okay. So I certainly understand uh, about the asynchronous and synchronous courses. When I teach asynchronous courses, when I put them together, I see that the student completion rate is much lower than when I teach cohort courses. So I certainly understand that. So that's totally understandable. I'm curious about the instructors. So the instructors, I when I would think about credentials, I think different, definitely people from blue chip companies, but also I think people who are, let's say, wrote well, uh, uh, wrote good books about this topic, you know, ones that show them as credentialed, so that show the expertise, and or are professors at universities who know about the topic. So I'm curious why you chose, there are a number of ways of showing credentials. I'm curious why you focused at blue chip companies. I've done a fair amount of university education myself. I mean, mm-hmm. when I say I've done it, meaning I've I've spent enough time studying at universities, mm-hmm. and um, very often, including my um, MBA degree, uh, when you sit in the audience in the auditorium and the professor is teaching you, uh, is telling you about something, you ask yourself a question: Why are you teaching me about this? So you clearly have done a lot of research on the subject. Uh, You've written a couple of books about the subject, but I'm not quite sure you've actually have done the thing. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with professors, not to, you know, uh, uh, question the the concept of academia, Mm -hmm. but to question the concept of pure academia teaching people who expect practical skills. And um, what we teach, we teach practical skills that I'm pretty sure very few professors actually know, unless mm-hmm. they have been engaged in, 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 in some serious real life consulting work. There are some professors who do consulting on the side and, uh, you know, those usually have my deepest uh, respect because they combine academia with the real life. But a lot of academia have long lost the connection with the real life. And with real sure. jobs and with yeah, real markets, and um, and that's why um, you know I'm, I'm I'm sort of I'm sort of known for um, giving a lot of critique about the current system of uh, mm. college education today in the U.S. And um, when we teach everything, when we teach the same thing to everyone, mm. and uh, we often teach it using professors who have never done the thing, who have done it very long time ago and very little, but they have, have you know, uh, written their PhD thesis and they have done a lot of research and published a lot of books, but they haven't really done this. Um, that's why we do things differently. We work mm. with uh, experts who come from the field, who come from the trenches. Mm. Okay, so you would work with experts from blue chip companies and professors who do consulting on the side, but you want to work with people who did not come do consulting, who didn't have that experience. That makes sense. Yeah. And uh, a lot of education in the current days, I think, is a lot of it is about signaling. I mean, showing that you have gotten the diploma, meaning that you are able to do work rather than that you learn something useful. So that's kind of something that I think is definitely a problem with the modern education system. <laughs> Absolutely. Um... And the more prestigious is the diploma, uh, the more we tend to trust it blindly. Mm. Um, yeah. Whereas I've met a lot of people who didn't have really good GPA scores mm-hmm. um, at all, and, but they are one of the smartest people I've met. They were just bored at schools and bored mm. at universities, and they just were sure. motivated to to get good to get good grades but they're incredibly talented uh, 
professionals. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I know quite a few people with straight A's, but that was the only talent they have. <laughs> Just, you know, uh, put, put, put a lot of effort into studying sure. and put a lot of effort into, you know, getting the grades, passing the tests. But then they have no idea how to apply this knowledge to uh, to real life, how to benefit from it. And mm -hmm. I know quite a few straight aiders who aren't really big achievers. Makes sense. Now, when you uh, think about education inside Elevator for your own team, what kind of training do you do for your own team? That's actually a subject that is uh, pretty hotly debated right now. Um, oh. We we <laughs> internally um, because I think that uh, at some uh, at some point I realized that uh, we don't do a very good job at this. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, with that you know we're that proverbial uh, the shoemaker without shoes. Yes, yes, and. Um, so we need to eat our own dog food at some point. Yeah. And um, I have appointed uh, someone in the team who is now responsible for developing the internal L&D program, learning and development programs mm -hmm. uh, for the teams. Um, because we have really, really strong people in the team. Uh, mm -hmm. We're extremely demanding. We're very selective. Um, but nobody knows everything. And um, I realized that most of my team members could benefit from uh, learning something that they currently don't have uh, the knowledge, and um, uh, we're gonna we, we're gonna start doing that pretty soon. But um, that's a that's a good subject. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of companies, if it's a big company, they have big L and D L and D programs and budgets mm -hmm. and so on. But a lot of startups, they're not very focused on developing uh, uh, their own teams which is which is a mistake yeah i think it's a mistake and it's you know i was wondering what how you did it given that you're an education company <laughs> we know how to do it like yes. we know how to build courses and we know how to teach people mm -hmm. uh we just never thought about uh teaching our own people and now we have and now we will start doing it and do you think you'll be doing it remotely do you think you'll be doing something in person what are your thoughts about that direction, that that type of issue? Let's talk about it in a month or two. Fair enough. Fair We're enough. Still yet to figure that out. All right. Is there anything about remote work that I haven't asked you? Anything else that you would like to share about remote work, about Elevator, before we wrap up? I think we're good. Thank you very much for the uh, for the wonderful opportunity. You're very welcome. And thank you to all the listeners for listening and checking out this episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Again, my name is Dr. Gleb Sapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts. I hope you subscribe to this show and please leave a review on whatever platform you checked out the show. It helps other people discover the show. Thank you very much again, Roman, and look forward to seeing everyone on the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.